Yes, he is. He's on he's on vacation. But yeah, they just. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but they should be. Go Gators. Go Gators. Mm. All right, I think we're ready. Where's he?
shout out your praise with joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We shout out your praise. Shout out your praise. We shout out your here this morning to worship Jesus and without Jesus what would we have and with him how could we want more good morning I want to welcome you to Oak Griner Baptist Church I'm glad to see everybody this morning um, packed house this morning it's always good to see um, we are a body of believers um, we are sinners and saints that have been uh, redeemed by the blood of Christ and so we're glad to see you this morning. Um, and we're going to take just a few seconds, a few minutes, a minute or so to welcome everybody this morning. If you'll just shake each other's hands, find somebody you don't know, welcome them this morning. Oh, the 
Yes, I know. You did. I didn't even hear you go. You did it. She was doing it. I heard it. I couldn't hear it. And even if I would have heard it, I don't think it's going to sound it. And Van is coming up to do announcements. Oh, shoot. I see we have a talkative group today. Am I on? Yes. Can you hear me? They're not paying attention. Attention on deck. Yeah. Well, I'm glad y'all are out there saying hello to one another anyhow. Uh, to start off with, Miss Diane has an announcement for us. Maybe they have this on by now. <laughs> Matt doesn't know how dangerous it is yet to give me a microphone. <laughs> we know. <laughs> yeah, y'all know. Anyway, is everybody ready for some football? All right, I want all the, the young men and the, and the older men to stand for just a minute. Ever, all the men. Terry, that's you. That's you. Anyway, I want you to look around on September 12th. We're going to be feeding 100 of these. So that's a lot of food. Y'all can sit down. That was just a visual. <laughs> sep sep September 12th, we're feeding the Vanguard JV football team. They're going to be eating at 3.30. We're making, we're not making. It's Stouffer's lasagna. You just stick it in the oven and take it to Vanguard and some garlic bread. And uh, Judy's making brownies. So anyway, after service, if you want to make some lasagna, heat up some lasagna, please see me because we're going to have like 15 pans of lasagna, like that big. So I can use all the help. And uh, if not everybody knows it, you must be dead. But this, <laughs> this is Culpepper shirt, mm -hmm. who went to Vanguard. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> it would have took a lot to take it off of him. <laughs> uh, you got your, your announcements in here. I'll let you read them, but I'm only going to do one. And that's your sign-up sheet in the back for The Way of the Master. Uh, if you've not gone through that book, I've read it, and I'm still going to go through the class. So... Take, make sure you sign up for it because we all need that. And it actually kind of goes along with a couple questions I have for our different Sunday school classes. For the youth, is life meaningless? You got to think about that one a lot. But this next one, you really need to think about. If you have accepted Jesus as your Savior... Why didn't he just take you on to heaven? You need to find out why. And then for Keith's class, why did God create us? Do we really have a purpose or are we just here? You need to think about that one. All right. Whoops, might help if I put my glasses on. I'm as bad as a preacher. <laughs> <laughs> In Psalms, this is David, and I think the Lord's really speaking to him in this particular psalm, Psalms 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor, my right hand, until I humble your enemies. Make them a footstool under your feet. The Lord will extend your powerful kingdom from Jerusalem. And I think we kind of see that a little bit today. 
You will rule over your enemies. When you go to war, your people will serve you willingly. You are arrayed in a holy garment. And your strength will be renewed each day like the morning dew. The Lord has taken an oath and will not break his vow. You are a priest from the order of Melchizedek. The Lord stands at your right hand to protect you. He will strike down many kings when his anger erupts. He will punish the nations and fill their lands with corpses. He will shatter heads over the whole earth. But he himself will be refreshed from the brooks along the way. And this is the last part I like. He will be victorious. For ushers. Let's pray. Lord God, creator of all, who always looks after us, always takes care of us. It's hard to imagine that there are people that don't want that. But it's up to us to reach out and share what we have because of what you did on the cross. We thank you for just loving us the way that you do. Be with these tithes and offerings that they might be used for you. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Shoot at 
my shelter, it's my defense. I claim it over and over again. I plead the blood. I plead the blood of Jesus. Oh, plead the blood. thank you for being here this morning. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your, your grace. We thank you for the beauty of the cross, Lord. 
Dear God, I thank you for this family of believers, Lord, that hold each other up, hold each other accountable, help lift us up when we fall. Dear God, I thank you for the witness that this house of worship has in our community. And dear God, I pray that you help us, help to remind us, Lord, that people want to see you in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. We ask all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Uh, The Children's Church, you can be dismissed at this time. And you can have a seat. Amen. So we are wrapping up this growing through conflict. We have two more lessons, and then we're done. Next week, uh, my parents will be here. Go figure. The week that they're here, here's the topic. Ready? Conflict with a rebellious son. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) my parents will be here that week, so they might have some stories. Uh, I'm talking about my brother now, not me. Um, So, uh, and then the week after that, um, I know there's a few of you in here that you have, you know, you've lost a child. Um, And uh, no matter what stage that's in, it's difficult. And I don't care if they were to turn 70 this month. It's still difficult. Uh, That's what we're going to be looking at, uh, conflict with deathbed on the following week. But today, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11, we're going to be looking at conflict with sexual desires. David, if you remember last week, is sitting triumphantly. He's sitting on his throne. Hey, you remember those times in your life where life was just good? Everything's going your way. Everything's happening for you. The Bible even says three times in that text, we looked at last week, that God had given David rest from all his enemies. How many of y'all, you're at rest with all your enemies right now? Let me rephrase that question. How many of you are at rest with any of your enemies right now? Huh? Um, but guess what? How often does our heartache and our difficulties come back because of poor choices we make. So before we look at our text, 2 Samuel chapter 11, there's this little uh, story. It's called the glue trap of lust. Adam Hamilton tells the story of moving into his house after it was built, only to discover that it was infested with mice. So he got glue traps, which have a scent that attracts the mice. They step on it, and they're stuck. Then the mice need to uh, be killed and disposed of. He was very successful in using them until until he found a mouse struggling to free itself and actually gnawing off his foot to do so. Do you ever feel that temptation has brought you to that point? You want out, but you don't know how to get out because you're so entrapped that you're willing to do whatever it takes to get set free. And then he writes, when I think about lust and its power in our lives, it smells good, it feels good, and looks good, And we find ourselves stuck in the glue trap. We pull and try to get away and we can't break free. We end up dying a slow and painful death when we are in the glue trap. And sometimes that's what happens to us. 
And it might not be pornography. It might not be sen- sexual. But we all have something that so easily besets us. We all have something that we continue to be ensnared in. Today we're just focusing on, as we are consistent with what we're going through, uh, we are consistent. We're going to 2 Samuel chapter 11. We've been all these other things that David had conflict with. And this is where we come to. So now if you have your Bibles, turn to, uh, again, 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11, and we'll be looking at the first five verses. 2 Samuel 11, and Van, I have to put on my reading glasses. Y'all don't look. Y'all look at your Bibles. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm not that vain. 2 Samuel chapter 11 says this. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle. Pay attention to that. That David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. And David maintained at Jerusalem. Remember that. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked down to the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent in and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came into him, and she lay with I'm sorry, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. Verse 5 says, And the woman conceived, so that she sent and told David. And said, I am with child. What a predicament. This is going to be hard to hide. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. (laughs) Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that you'll speak to us. Lord, you know our hearts. You know where we are. You know what we struggle with. You know, Lord, so often we tend to dive into sin and enjoy sin until we get caught. And then once we're caught, then we try to crocodile tears to to fake repentance, Lord, just to get the attention somewhere else. But Lord, help us to learn from the examples of David. Lord, help us to grow through conflict with sexual desires or whatever conflict, we, whatever desire we have. Lord, Give us the strength. Lord, help us to desire to please you more than pleasing ourselves. And Lord, that's what it comes down to. We're going to please either you or we're going to please ourselves. Lord, I pray that you will help us to love you to the point where we want to please you more than we want to please ourselves. In your name I pray. Amen. So we look at our text. The first thing I want to see is the setup. The setup. Look at verse 1 of our text. It happened in the spring of the year. It's good that we get so much information. We know what time of year it was. We don't know what month, but we know it's in the springtime. And we also know that this is a time when kings were to go out to battle. But where's David? He's supposed to be out to battle, but he's at home. Battles that one time, let me tell you something, battles that one time that the soldiers want their leader present. Could you imagine a catastrophe goes on in our church or maybe even in our community and everybody comes to church and everybody's seeking hope here, everyone's seeking shelter here, and your pastor's not here? That's what we have here. Men going to war, men at war fighting, and their leader is back at home. We don't know why, but I'm going to tell you, it's irrelevant. He should have been with his men. Then David sent Joab and his servants with him and all to Israel, and they destroyed, granted, at least they were victory, victorious, and besieged Rabbah, and but David remained at Jerusalem. 
Now what you're going to notice is this downward spiral. And by the way, that's usually how sin happens. You don't just, oh my goodness, what happened? You know, hopefully November you'll vote no for the number four. Let's just remember that, no for four. Just remember that. It's where the government has complete rule and regulation of abortions. Do you know that Kamala, Kabbalah, Harris, whatever you want to call her, is going to make abortion the law of the land? And most of it's to cover up this downward spiral that people have brought upon themselves. But David's in the wrong place. Be careful where you are. Make sure there's accountability. Ladies, gentlemen, doesn't matter who you are. There's no need for you to be on your phone or on your computer in the dark in a lonely room by yourself. Period. I used to remember teenagers when I was a youth pastor for 30 plus years. Go out and find them out in the dark, just the two of them, a male and a female, go fig. We had things to discuss privately. Oh, no, you don't. Do not put yourself in that predicament. Amen. Oh, but I'm strong enough. No, you're not. The strongest man in the Bible was, was who? Yes. Samson. He failed. Solomon, the wisest king, failed. David, the man after God's own heart, failed. All in the same area. How often do we see pastors coming up in the news, failing in the same area. One of my favorite, uh, uh, Robbie Zacharias. I got to see him in Philly. I, I, I just admired his wisdom. I admired his knowledge. Failed here. Guess what? If you're thinking you're strong enough, take heed lest you fall. They say that this is every man's battle. And it begins, well actually it doesn't begin here. It begins actually, we're going to look at it a little bit where it begins. But this is the downward spiral here. First of all, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. If you're in the right place or if you always practice accountability, it's more difficult to fail. But David's not doing the right thing. What if David was sick? Let's just pretend he was sick. And he's back at his room praying for his soldiers. You think, ooh, what about that? It had been hard for him to see what he shouldn't have seen. And if he would not have seen what he shouldn't have seen, then he wouldn't have done what we're about to see he does. So David was not doing the right thing. It's not just that we, oh, we tripped and fell. It is a progression or a degression, I would like to say. David neglected his duty. David had too much idle time. Everybody says, I don't have enough time. We sure have enough time to dabble in things we shouldn't be dabbling in. David also neglected his spiritual man. And this is what we want to look at. This is where it really goes to pot. This is where it really began. 2 Samuel 5.13 says, And David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem. Now this is the same David. We've been looking at the last, what, 10 weeks that he marries Michael. He marries another girl. He marries Abigail. Remember? Nabal, the fool, marries Abigail, and now he's going to take on another wife. We can see that David has absolutely no respect for God's creation. Men, women are not meat. Women, men are not meat. They are created by a holy God. And when you see them anything other than creations of God, then you have a really 
horrible aspect of who God is. Females were not here for ple just pleasure. Men were not put here for just pleasure. Now you say, well, was it really a thing back in then that you couldn't have too many wives? Glad you asked. Deuteronomy 17, 17a says, Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. You think God knew what he was talking about? Oh, yeah. Especially from a God who's already seen the end from the beginning. He knew, which kind of makes you think, oh, when you read the scriptures now, you're like, oh, yeah, that's right. He did know the end. So this is why he knew what to put in his word. Because he's God. But then David responds in a wrong manner. First Samuel 16, 13 says, Then Samuel took the horn of the oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Let me tell you something. I've heard people say, well, you know what? David didn't have the power of the Spirit of the Lord upon his life. Yes, he did. It's right there. Just like we have. If you were born again, the Spirit of God dwells in you. And that one of the duties of the Holy Spirit is to convict you of sin. And to bring you, you know what? Some of y'all, I'm living, I'm miserable. Maybe it's because you're dwelling in sin. And it brings us to the place, and again, guess what? Conviction's not bad. Guilt's not bad. Being ashamed is not bad. Why? Because it's supposed to bring you to Repentance. And when it brings you to repentance, you can confess those sins and be forgiven of those sins and move forward. It's the way it's supposed to work. Galatians 5.16 says, I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I'm going to tell you the simplest way. I know everyone in here has heard this before, but it I, I'm a person that needs examples. Okay, I'm a very, I don't know, something kind of learner where you have to have, you know, visual aids and that's me. Well, here's my visual aids. Every person in here, you have two dogs. Okay? And you're, and you're a Michael Vick. You like to fight those dogs. You have the spirit. You have the flesh. And the dog you feed the most is going to win. Pastor, I don't know how to be, I don't know how to endure. I don't know how to get through this. Which dog are you feeding? When you're continually feeding that fleshly dog, that fleshly dog's going to win every single time. But you start striving to feed that spiritual dog and that spiritual dog's getting fed and that spiritual dog's in prayer and that spiritual dog's in God's word and that spiritual dog's in the community then it's more difficult and almost impossible for the weaker dog to win. That's what this verse is talking about. Walk in spirit, not in the flesh. Remember this verse we've used so many weeks, but it's very applicable here because now you can see the digression here. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Now follow, hey, as you're reading this, look at David, who's walking, pacing up in his balcony, goes over to the window, and stands in the window, looks out, sees what he shouldn't see. Then he goes and sits in the seat of the scornful, so let's look at the, the sin. The sin. The first one is lust. So look at verses 2 through 3. He saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. Stop. David truly accidentally saw something. And he noticed that she was beautiful. 
Has he sinned yet? No. Let me tell you something. Man, there is no harm in telling a lady. And I tell my wife first. A lot of times I'll do this. I'll say, uh, what? I'll say, I was, man, she's just a beautiful woman. I'm going to go tell her that. Is it okay with you? Or, or, or she smells good, you know. And I don't want my wife to see me telling her, hey, you smell good, girl. No, I'm not going to do that. But you know what? Ladies, there's nothing wrong with someone saying, you know what? I just want you to know you're beautiful and that's it. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. David saw her. She was beautiful. Hey, as at this point, David has not sinned. But does he turn away? By the way, there's a difference in looking and noticing and gawking. You've seen what media has done. You remember the old, the wolf, which his tongue rolls out of his mouth, his eyes pop out of his head, and you know. Isn't that pretty much, it's that look and that continuing to stare and that you haven't blinked in the last 15 minutes. That is lust. Well, Let's continue reading. So David sent and inquired about the woman. Can I stop again? She's not your wife. Why do you care? Guess what? David, you're married. A whole lot of times. Why does it matter what her name is? Why does it matter to you who she is? You saw something you shouldn't have seen. Let it go. But no, David says, who is that girl? And someone even tells him, that's, uh, I think that's uh, Uriah's wife, the Hittite. Okay, this is where David, the godly man, says, well, guess what? Well, his wife didn't matter, so why would somebody else's wife matter? But at the same time, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, first of all, I'm already married. I shouldn't be asking about this woman. I'm already married. I shouldn't care who she is. I'm definitely not going to send somebody to go get her. Because A, I'm married, and B, she's not, she belongs to somebody else. He even knows now who she belongs to. Uriah, who is a very, as we're seeing a little bit, he's a very faithful servant. He's a very faithful soldier. And again, this does not even sway David in the slightest. Because if we are honest with ourselves, we come to places where, you know what? We get past the point of no return. Our fleshly lust is so deep and so effective and they completely overtake us that there is nothing that's going to stop us. How often do you hear of rape? Where people are fighting for their lives to, to avoid it, but they're beaten in the process. Because our body is completely overcome. And by the way, when that, we are completely overcome, that is a spirit of devil, of demon, demons. And guess what? The Holy Spirit should be in control of us and not our lusts. First John 2, 15 and 17 says, Do not love the world. Or the things in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is of the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Every sin will fall into these categories. David says she was beautiful to look at. This lust of the eyes. David says go get her. He lays with her lust of the flesh, pride of life. I wonder if David was thinking, I'm the king. I can get whatever I want. I'm the, I'm the man after God's own heart. I don't know David's heart. I know right now it's not where it should be. James 1, 12 and 13 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. In other words, you don't fall. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord promises to those who love him. I would love to end there. That's so beautiful. 
I would love to believe that everyone here, including myself, always is victorious in, in, in my temptation. But I'm not. That's the next verse. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away from his own desires. How often do we blame the devil? The devil made me do it. No, he doesn't. If we're honest with ourselves, most of the things we do, we do because we wanted to do it. No one held a gun to David's head and said, you stay home instead of going where you need to be. No one put it, you know, twisted his arm and said, ignore the guards that are around you. You don't need accountability. Let me tell you something. If you don't have an accountability partner, you need one. Someone to keep you accountable. Someone to hold you accountable. And enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, I'm still quoting King James, so bear with me, brings forth death. Remember, this is the second time we've heard this story before. For the wages of sin is... Adam, if you eat of that tree, you will surely... When are we going to get it? Sin brings death. That death isn't just a literal death. We're all going to die. It's a separation from God. There's a quote. Sow a thought, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a lifestyle. Sow a lifestyle and reap a destiny. This is our lives. And the sad thing is, is what most people think when no one knows. No, you know what? I'm going to tell you something. Not just God. Someone always knows. You can be on an island that there's only a spot this big and your toe is on it and you're balancing. And there's no one within thousands and thousands of miles. And as soon as you mess up, guess what? I saw that. What? Someone always knows. And even if they don't, God always knows. And he's the only one we should really care about. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Flee also youthful lusts. We'll stop there. Remember the story of Joseph? Potiphar's wife was thinking he's a good looking young man. By the way, we know she was good looking. You know why? You might know why she, we know she was good looking. Rich don't marry ugly. Am I wrong? Rich don't marry ugly. So she was probably beautiful, gorgeous. And he's a 17 year old kid. What does he do? He runs. He runs. He doesn't sit there and go, no, just stay back, woman. I'm going to continue my job over here, but you stay right there. He, no. You know what? He doesn't put his stuff in a box and put it on top of his closet and say, I'm going to give that up. He gets it out of his life. Guys, maybe we need to get passwords on our computers. Maybe we need to get passwords on our phones and give our wives the password. And wives, maybe you need to give your password to your husband. Ladies, don't make it the same as one you had for him. Some guys will figure that out. It's not just about moving it aside. It's about getting it out of your life. But pursue righteousness. David's not pursuing righteousness right now. Faith. Love. David, when are you going to stop and say, I love my Lord too much. I love my wife too much. I love my children too much. 
David, where are you? Man, are we the same way? Hey, I used to have, I need to do it again. But I used to have a big piece of paper across my screen. And I put on there, reasons to watch my eyes. Because of my Lord. By the way, don't just say family. Oh, no. Every name. My wife. This son. My, I name every one of my kids. And because of internet sake, I'm not going to name my kids. But my kid one, my kid two, my kid three, my kid four. My church, my family, my, my sanity. We have to have something keeping us from destroying our lives and the lives of our family. Wes, where'd you go, man? Well, Wes, wherever you are, that song about the, I want to protect my family, stand for my family. Hey, this is one of the greatest ways you can do it. You know how often that it's pornography that destroys families? By the way, where do your pedophiles come from? Someone who dabbled in pornography. Why do you think we have homosexuality at an all-time high? Why do you think we have abortions at an all-time high? There was a start. It's pornography. Wait up. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, by the way, good time for a plug. His new movie's coming out, and I am excited. By the way, it's about Thanksgiving time. So if you want to do something for your pastor on Thanksgiving, you see me. No, I get to watch free movies anyway, so don't worry about that. Um, but I am going to go see it, because I've always been a Dietrich Bonhoeffer fan. But he says this. He describes the struggles of David. When his desires took control, he says this. In our members, there is a slumbering inclination toward desire which is both sudden and fierce. With irresistible power, desire seizes mastery of the flesh. All at once a secret smoldering fire is kindled. The flesh burns and is in flames. In this moment, God is quite unreal to us. And Satan does not hear Fill us with hatred of God, but with a forgetfulness of God. The lust, therefore, aroused and envelopes, sorry, envelops the mind and the will in the deepest, darkest. It is here that everything in me rises up against the word of God. The powers of clear discrimination and of decision are taken from us. You know what? You can't even make coherent decisions. The, uh, the questions present themselves as, is what the flesh desires really sin? Is this really sin? Is this, I mean, is this really what God said? Let me show you how Eve said it. How, let me tell you what the devil said to her. Hath God said, by the way, he was right and she was wrong. Because she said, we can't touch or eat. And he said, has God said that? Yes, he sure did. No, he didn't. He said, don't eat it. But granted, yes, if you touch it, that's going to make it worse. Let's continue. Is what the flesh desires really sin in this case? And is it really not permitted to me? Yes, expected to men. Now here is my particular situation to appease the desire. It is here that everything within me rises up against the word of God. Therefore, the Bible teaches us in times of temptation in the flesh, there is one command. Flee. Flee fornication. Flee idolatry. Flee youthful lust. Flee the lust of the world. There is no resistance to Satan or our flesh. In lust other than flight... Every struggling against lust in one's own strength is doomed to failure. How do you avoid temptation? Stay away from it. See, we want to get as close to it as we can without touching it. No. Stay away from it, as far away from it as possible. James 4, 7 says, therefore, submit to God. Now, I can't tell you how many times in my life somebody's come to me and said, 
Well, the Bible says resist the devil and he will flee from you, but it's not working. That's because you only got half the solution. You're missing the most important solution. It's right here. Submit to God. Your thoughts, your heart, your life. Then doing that, it's a little easier to resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Next thing we look at is adultery. We're no longer about the lust now. Now you've, you've went there, David. You went, you brought her to the house, and it was not to get to know her. I mean, well, it was, but it was not to have coffee and talk about the weather. Look at verse 4 of the text. Verse 4. Then David sent messengers. By the way, this is really sad here. Because his messengers could have worked, could have served as accountability partners. But he involves them. So he sends them and they help David sin. David sends messengers and took her. And she came to him and he lay with her. Was there nothing that clicked? Hey, guys, do me a favor. Go get that girl over there. You, just, you know the one you just told me was Uriah, Uriah's wife? Go get her and bring her to me. David, um, aren't you married like 12 times already? And we just told you that she belonged to somebody. But they do what their king has commanded. And who know, you know, it would have been nice for in that moment of waiting, instead of, instead of, I could see David running into the bathroom, putting on his cologne and making sure his hair is looking good, probably brushing his teeth again. Really? All this time you could think God has time to, 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 to penetrate and to change this because he is filled with the Spirit. The Spirit was doing his job. But how often do we ignore the Spirit and quench the Spirit? And say, Lord, no matter what happens, I'm willing to face the consequences. That's because we don't understand the consequences. That's because we don't know the consequences. In one of our homes, when our kids were younger, we used to put on our bathroom mirror. Yeah, you can make your own choices, but you can't make your consequences. You can't choose your consequences. And they're always more than you want to pay and can pay. The, the fact that David, she says, hey, David, I'm pregnant. Guess what? That's the least of his consequences. Next week, you're going to see the brunt of the most of the consequences in the rebellious son. That should be plural and family tree, actually, I should say, but it's just son. He commits adultery. By the way, People say, well, I've never committed adultery. Well, Jesus says it like this. You have heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that if a man looks on a woman and lusts after her, he hath committed adultery in his heart. And you ladies go, whoo. He said, man. No, it, it's both. Women, if you've looked on a man with lust, you've committed adultery with him in your heart. You're no better off than David. I'm no better off than David. God gives us powerful passions and expects us to control them as a test of our loyalty. Guys, I'm not going to lie to you. When God created woman, that was the, the greatest I, my, I'm just, this is my opinion. That was his just bragging and showing off. I mean, wow. Did you know that he wanted women to be beautiful? Why? Because he wanted men, because he wanted the husbands of the wives to enjoy their wife forever until they die. 
Sex was such a powerful thing that if it's done right, can keep a marriage together. It's strong enough to. But we live in a day and time where you got to test drive the car first. And even though I bought this car, I still want to drive someone else's car. No wonder the power is diminishing. It's not because it's diminished. It's just diminished in your life because you flaunted it. You've wasted it. I remember when I was in high school, I had a guy come up to me and make fun of me in the locker room. And uh, usually I had this bully that usually picked on me. I know that surprises you. You all better be surprised. Well, this one kid picked on me all the time. So I was just kind of used to it, you know. I just started preparing myself for when it was coming. But one time, those guys in the, in the locker room started making fun of me and started laughing at me and pointing at me, laughing. He's a virgin. He's, like, He's a virgin. The kid that normally picks on me picked, yelled at the top of his lungs, y'all all need to shut up right now. What I wouldn't give to bear, be where he is. I was like, yeah, you tell him, you tell him. But here's what he said. It take me three seconds to be like any of you. I can never be what he is. You can't take it back. And when you're standing up at that altar and you're holding hands and you look at the love of your life, and this is the first time you talked about this, which is horrible, and you say, I'm so glad I took all that and I saved myself and I kept myself pure for you. Aren't you glad you can do the same? And you can't say the same. And you cannot give that person you want to spend the rest of your life with, you cannot give them that assurance that it's only been them because you're wasting it. Commits adultery. But then as we're going to continue, we look a little bit later, he's going to commit murder. Here's David, the man after God's own heart, luring a woman to bed and then lying to cover his sin. When that didn't work, he murdered a man to make sure that he would get by with his secrets. How many of us still carry that lie that no one knows? No one will ever find out. The Bible says this, be sure your sins will find you out. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest you fall. Before you begin to judge David too harshly, we're the same. We don't see ourselves the same, but God's holiness reveals that we're the same. But one thing David did not consider was the unnecessary collateral damage. By the way, you do know that there's always collateral damage when you sin. Someone will pay the piper. Someone will pay the cost. And by the way, you always will pay. It's not like you're going to get a a bailout. (laughs) Not going to happen. We will pay the piper. Verse 26 of our text. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David done displeased the Lord. And what's really interesting is the only time where he was displeased is after he brings her as his wife. Now, It all displeased the Lord. But can I tell you something? How many times in our day and time where people make a foolish mistake and they maybe have sex out of wedlock, but guess what they do? They force a marriage. Do not make mistakes to cover up your mistakes. Do not lie to cover up your lies. But now, it's out. It's kind of... It's kind of hard to cover that you're pregnant. And, you know, uh, Uriah's nowhere around, so he's out in the field at war, so we know good and well he didn't do it. So David has to 
cover his self, the hiding. First of all, David betrays Uriah. David betrays Uriah, sleeping with his wife. And I was talking to Susan this week, and this is what bothers me the most. Back in this time, do you know how important seed was? Your offspring, giving birth to children, that was huge. And Uriah is not able to do this with his wife because of David. But not only does he deceive Uriah, I'm sorry, betray Uriah, but he, okay, this one on your, this one here, there is a two Uriah, ignore that word two, T-O, it says T-O, ignore that. It's a typo. I take full responsibility for that. But David deceives Uriah. You know the story where David says, Uriah, come in, take a load off. Here's a gift, here's some food, here's some... Gives them all this stuff. Go spend time with your wife. Enjoy yourself. And David has to be more convicted by the response from Uriah. Because Uriah says, I cannot. I will not. So here's why. Because why? Because all the other soldiers are out there on the field battling. They're sleeping in tents. King David you're worth my attempts. You're worth my efforts. I would never do that to you. I would never do that to them. I would never do that to God. And he's being the soldier of fortune. I mean, he is the soldier of soldiers. And he says, no, go home. And he goes to bed. David gets up in the morning and notices that Uriah's camped out in front of his door. What are you doing? I told you to go home. Hey, I can't. Now, this is getting more difficult, because why? Because David's got, I now cannot explain how your wife is pregnant. But David is disloyal to Uriah. Look at verse 12. Then David said to Uriah, wait here today also and tomorrow. I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now, when David called him, he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. David got him drunk. Man, just how, how low can you go? Anyway, it says, made him drunk. Um, hold on, I went blank here. Okay, find it. Um, look at verse 10. So when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, now he's going to use that Ignoring my authority. He says, David said to Uriah, did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, the ark, and the, by the way, the ark, this is, man, I tell you, Uriah, that was a dagger. The ark was the presence of God. He said, because of God, his presence in my life, I cannot do what you did, David. The ark in Israel, his people, and Judah are all dwelling in tents, and my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house and eat and drink and live with my wife? Why do I deserve the pleasures that no one else can have? As you live... And as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. But you know what? We still don't see any difference in David. There's no sorrow. There's no brokenness. It's not until the next chapter, the confrontation. So Nathan comes to David. By the way, Nathan's smart. <laughs> Nathan's not a dummy. He didn't just come and go, hey, David, I know what you did. 
He comes to David, he tells a story. Verses 1 through 4 of chapter 12, he tells a story of a, of a man who has everything. He has all the sheep in the world. He's got the money. He's got everything. And he says, but, he says, but David, there's this, this guy who had everything, went to this farmer that had one precious sheep. And he took that precious sheep from the guy who had the one. And David is furious. David is like, oh, my goodness. Oh, well, here it is. It's in... Um, Verse 5, 2 Samuel, look over to page to 2 Samuel chapter 5, um, chapter 12, verse 5. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And before he dies, though, he shall restore fourfold of the lamb because he did this thing and because of he had no pity. And then Nathan goes, David? Thou art the man. Before we begin to judge others, realize, David, that the person I'm talking about is you. Now I'm going to tell you, you would think that because this is the only time where David begins to repent, that it's because he got caught. Well, I'm going to tell you, I would believe that, however, Psalm 51 proves that he is truly repentant. When he says things like, Create in me a clean heart, O Lord my God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away. <clears throat> so we know that David had truly repented. But guess what? <clears throat> when you repent... It doesn't make the consequences go away. You'll know that David and Bathsheba lose that child. In fact, David even spent many days in prayer and fasting, begging God to spare that baby. Remember what we looked at the week about conflict with unanswered prayers? What lessons would David have learned if God would have spared that baby? David, you did this. David, you did this to yourself. You did this to your family. How do you go home and tell your wife, oh, by the way, I got another kid from another lady? Pick one. But we have the charge. Nathan charge David by the way it was bold because he could have lost his life but he charges him and he stands and by the way let me tell you something maybe you know of somebody who's not right there is a right way of doing it did you notice how Nathan did this he didn't go hey King David you stinking moron He does it in a loving manner, but he does confront him. You might know someone who needs, hey, they need to be confronted. Well, why is it my place? Are you a friend? Because if you're a friend, then you need to confront it, but confront it in love. I, I, don't, I, and I don't know. I, I've been wondering, had Nathan not told David that, would we have ever had Psalm 51 in the Bible? Don't know. But I'm glad we do. Sorry that what it cost, but I'm glad we do. The charge, the conviction. Um, chapter 12, verse 7 says, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah and that it had been too little. I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed your right of the Hittite with a sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife. You have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. I'm going to ask you, you will to turn with your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. 
This is a lengthy read, but it's very, very good. In fact, here's what I want you to do. I, I'm not going to read it right now, but I want you to go home and read it and really dwell on it. Galatians chapter 5, verses 17 through 26. And I want you to, you've got your paper for your notes right there beside you. Go home and read that and pay close attention to it because it's very, very powerful. Um, and I've just got, yeah, trust me, you'll, you, you won't regret it. It's about walking in the Spirit again. But then you have the confession. David said to Nathan, Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And again, Psalm 51, if you go back and read that, that's David's prayer of repentance because of that event. That whole Psalm 51 is because of what happened with Bathsheba. <clears throat> the consequences. Verse 10 says, Now therefore the sword, this is chapter 12, by the way, the sword shall never depart from your house. Remember that time of peace we all want? David had it. But because of David's sin, it will never come again. Now think about that. Not just in your lifetime, David, but your family heritage will never be at peace again. Because you have despised me and have taken the wife. Nope. Yep, that's right. I will take your wives from before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives. Oh, my goodness. Let me tell you something. When I read this, how many of you men think about God taking your wife and giving them to somebody else and they can do whatever they want with them? I tell you right now, that... Man, if, it didn't, if that didn't bother you, there's a problem. Wife, what about you? God says, I'm taking your husband away and giving him to whoever I want to give him to. Hopefully, you didn't go, thank you, Lord, it's about time. Hopefully, you didn't think that. Luke 8, 17 says, For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. Again, as I said before, we just saw this. Nathan proved what I said about be sure your sins will find you out. There you have it. David Guzik says this. David knew this was wrong, yet he did it. It's hard to explain David's thinking because David wasn't thinking. He acted on feeling and impulse instead of thinking. If David had thought about all of this, he would have seen the cost was so much greater than he wanted to consider at the time. If David had only known that his illicit pursuit of pleasure would directly or indirectly result in an unwanted pregnancy, the murder of a trusted friend, a dead baby, a daughter raped by his son, one son murdered by another, a civil war led by one of his own sons, a son who imitates David's lack of self-control, leading him and much of his Israel away from God. Solomon, the good king, the wise king. At this moment, David agreed with the world's understanding of the purpose of sex, seeing it primarily as the pursuit of a pleasurable experience. And because of this, millions of babies lose their lives. With his many wives, David may have never really understood God's purpose for sex to be the cement that helps bond together a one flesh relationship. David's sin was forgiven by God, which is good. I'm going to tell you, let's stop right there for a second. If any of this is hit home and any of this is, is you, God can still forgive. God still forgo forgave David for all of it. Absolutely all of it. But when you're forgiven, it does not take away consequences. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, 
that he will also reap. For he who sows his flesh will reap flesh, reap corruption. But he who sows the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Now I'm going to show you a video and then we're done. But I want you to pay close attention. Most of y'all have heard the song before. Most of y'all know the song. But what we've talked about, just pay attention to it. 